Oh, hi, uh, me again. It's a little later in the day now. It's uh, evening time. I guess it's about 8 o'clock. There is an MBA class going on next door to me, uh, so hopefully I don't talk too loud and disturb them. Uh, but uh, at the same time, just have to say that because I want to make sure that you understand that a lot of classes you take will be in person. Um, I, again, have my own bias towards online education, but uh, that's a different thing. So <clears throat> from the last time, uh, we looked at a general introduction to law and talked about what law is, the right, the duty, and the capacity. Talked about the IRAC format of solving a problem uh, or legal problem. Talked about the Constitution and then talked a little bit about property law uh, both real property and personal property, and then intellectual property law, which is uh, really around in, intangible kinds of uh, uh, property, which is of great value in this day because it seems that whoever dies with the most information seems to not win the game rather than he who has the most toys or she who has the most toys. It's whoever has the most information. And it may not be a he or a she. It could be, of course, uh, an artificial intelligence that ultimately gets to this point. And then we talked a little bit about the concept of international law and that there really is no such thing because of the lack of capacity in all instances so that really it's the law of the jungle almost as might makes right uh, and not the law that we have come to accept as governing society regardless uh, the idea that no one's above the law uh, though there are some theories about that now floating around in regards to the current executive. Uh, the idea then of tort law, uh, what happens when your property is uh, harmed, your person, your property, or your reputation, uh, and how would that harm occur, whether it be intentionally through negligence or through strict liability. Talked a little bit about the relationship known as agency law, where one person works for the benefit and under the direction and control of the other. And we see a lot of the complications or the implications for employment law uh, also in dealing with HR. That's uh, in one of the directions that you may be going. And then we talked a little bit about the choice of entity. So what kind of uh, business form from a legal perspective will you take, a uh, proprietorship, a partnership, or a corporation, knowing that the corporation is the one that does provide for limited liability and that's something that we seem to like because it keeps us from losing more than whatever our investment in the business is. So the idea there was uh, we start a business uh, looking at, at it from uh, maybe alpha to omega. Uh, we start a business. What do we got to do? What are the filing requirements? Any capitalization requirements? Do we have to file papers to say uh, whether we are a proprietorship, a partnership, or a corporation, an LLC, an LLP, or whatever uh, variant of the idea of business we want. Uh, we also then have to think about insurance, about employees, and the responsibilities that befall us as uh, a business. We understand that if we do start a business or if we're engaged in business, uh, we're going to either sue or get sued. So think about it from the very um, one of the most basic of examples, the slip and fall, uh, which is primarily one of, the, one of the largest number of cases that's filed against businesses as we know about them currently. Uh, again, perhaps in the world of online uh, business, uh, we might not have as many uh, slips and falls, but we'll still have problems as far as fulfillment, delivery, uh, defective products, and what may also happen as a result of them. People will still get injured. Uh, they just won't get injured uh, at the store. They'll get injured at home, and they'll get injured because of the product rather than because of some dangerous situation that exists that uh, somebody maybe should have monitored a little bit better. Well, all of them come down to something that somebody should monitor a little bit better. So that's what you're trying to do as far as your study of business is concerned. So then... Uh, you know, either we're going to have negligence, uh, we're going to have things that our products don't work right or we don't get paid for the products that we sell, uh, which is essentially what we're talking about in contracts, where we have, a, 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 again, the uh, transactions occurring between parties where we have 
uh, a promise or set of promises for the breach of which the law will grant a remedy or the performance of which the law in some way recognizes a duty. Uh, we understand that all contracts are promises, but not all promises will arise to the level where they are enforced as contracts. Of course, everybody will ask the question then, well, what does it take for a promise to become enforceable at law as a contract? And you'll see that there are four elements principally. We call them agreement, consideration, capacity, and legality. Again, agreement, consideration, capacity, and legality. And these uh, elements all must be present for a valid and enforceable contract to be in place. Now, even if we have all four, the agreement, the consideration, the capacity, and the legality, we may find that we uh, have a defense or someone has a defense against what could otherwise be an enforceable agreement. And the first one is the lack of the genuineness of assent. In other words, people have come to make the agreement, but they were not necessarily of like meeting of the minds or uh, it wasn't necessarily voluntarily entered into. There could have been duress, coercion, undue influence. There could also have been fraud, manipulation, uh, things of that nature. So we do understand that there are defenses that even if someone has what would seem to be a valid contract, if a gun is placed to that person's head, whether literally or figuratively, that promise or that contract may not be binding. Now, so if we have that, you know, we can get out of the contract, or somebody can get out of the contract. Now, another thing that can get people out of a contract or, or party out of the contract is the form. And this goes along with the question that probably runs through many people's minds when they first hear about contracts is that do all contracts have to be written or are oral agreements binding? And the answer is oral agreements are binding. There is a problem obviously with that in that we don't know whose version of the oral agreement we should accept. So the law has come to develop different categories for which if you do not have a writing, somebody can get out of the deal. And the easiest way to remember this idea under the statute of frauds is that uh, there is a term, uh, an acronym, my legs. The M is for marriage. The Y is for a contract that cannot be performed by its own terms within a year. The L is for land. The E is for an executor's uh, promise to pay the debts of a deceased that have been discharged because of death. Uh, the G is goods. This is something under the Uniform Commercial Code uh, in excess of 500 or $5,000, depending on what kind of goods we are looking at. Again, remember that goods are tangible personal property that is movable uh, and uh, can be sold. And people who sell them are generally known as merchants. Merchants are people who have special uh, training, experience, skills in the sale of these particular goods and thus special rules apply to them that do not necessarily apply to the rest of us. And then the S is for a surety ship or a guarantee contract, kind of like a guaranteed student loan where the government guarantees against default in certain instances, but the government is not a co-signer of the contract itself so that people uh, that promise or vouch or will stand for another uh, will have to do this in writing otherwise that will not be enforceable so we we look at contracts and either they're going to um, happen or not happen and we either sue or get sued and then we then after a while after the business is successful uh, we pass the business on either by sale or by gift or by inheritance of some sort, uh, but there's a transfer so people have to figure out an exit strategy and um, it's always best of course to start with the end in mind. If you think about the current uh, environment where you got a bunch of what we call unicorns, these businesses that have become multi-billion dollar endeavors and multi-billion dollar entities that are just becoming public uh, like the recent uh, Uber uh, IPO, uh, before that a number of other IPOs, uh, including the company Zoom, which is the product that we're using to do these uh, class videos on. Uh, 
So you think about them, you think perhaps about uh, what was known as the FANG companies, uh, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. Um, two of those are still doing very, very well. Uh, other, the other two we uh, are, are still kind of looking at to see uh, what things are going on. And then we also understand that uh, particularly with technology, so we've seen Facebook and Google have some major problems in the area of regulation. Uh, their ability or their desire to self-regulate hasn't been that well manifested and the government is constantly talking about forcing regulation upon these entities. However, the age of technology is, is so quick and so fast and the development is so rapid that it's far outpaced the ability of the government to monitor. The first movers in the area of technology are the ones that have the most knowledge and are thus the ones that are, have the most ability to self-regulate. But of course, people tend to move in directions that best benefit themselves. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, next when we talk a little bit about the concept of ethics. Uh, I will have a PowerPoint that I'm using for ethics and I'll switch to that. Uh, I may or may not make the PowerPoint available, so please uh, pay attention. Um, the reason is that there are copyright concerns, intellectual property concerns. It's one thing for me as a teacher to use to help organize and present the material. It's another thing for me to give away for free, uh, especially in the context of having uh, no one having purchased the textbook. So we don't want to be uh, unethical in our own ways. Uh, it's okay for educational purposes to use it, but if there was, if there's a market for the material, then it's okay to talk about it, it's not okay to give away the actual files. So anyway, that's my uh, pitch to you right now. And remember also, as far as businesses are concerned, uh, nine out of 10 of them fail within the first four or five years. Uh, so we know that it is a very risky endeavor and that these multi-billion dollar unicorns are a rarity. So uh, don't count on it, which is why I think most of us are I'm still trying to learn either by, in a formal sense, by getting uh, advanced degrees like an MBA or by just keeping up with what's going on. So uh, we'll talk about uh, this next area and I'm going to use um, this uh, area of ethics from a, another uh, textbook that is used at Chaminade, but since this is an online class that does not require it, I'm just going to share the information with you. Uh, this is something under intellectual property called fair use, and it allows for the property to be used for educational purposes. As long as I'm not taking away a market for this, um, then I don't have to uh, worry too much about putting it up here. Uh, if you like, you can always buy the book, and then you can get access to this. There are other things as far as business law and ethics uh, are concerned as, that you will learn in classes for which you will need to get uh, text material because uh, it's something that's going to be necessary. Uh, so let's take a look at this. So here we're looking at the idea of the role of ethics uh, in business. And we'll find that most businesses are ethical. One out of five maybe are skirting the issue and, and trying to gain unfair advantage, but 80% of businesses being ethical and running for the best purposes and not just to make one uh, unbelievably wealthy, though there is a huge wealth gap. Uh, ethics does have a major role in business. Uh, then the legal principles and philosophies, or, or ethics principles and philosophies, uh, we want to take a look at some of those. Uh, and then sources of ethical issues in business decisions. Uh, there will always be those kind of things that you will have to deal with, uh, particularly as a manager, uh, if for no other reason other than you have to manage people, mitigate uh, conflict, uh, and try to negotiate deals. And that is going to require thinking about what's in the best interest of everybody involved, uh, 
sometimes you can't and you'll just have to deal with the reality that sometimes people get fired sometimes businesses get sued out of existence sometimes things essentially get banned uh, and never get legalized so this is something of an ethical and moral nature that you'll have to deal with and then making ethical business decisions how do you come to the right decision uh, and then of course business ethics on a global level i've previously stated that there really is no such thing as international law or, or so is there such a thing as international ethics and we already know that it is probably not the case because many times you have been made aware of the fact that in other countries bribery is legal uh, and if it's legal there can u.s businesses engaged in business abroad practice the same kinds of techniques that are done by others who are not u.s base or U.S. registered corporations? And we're going to see basically that the answer is no. Uh, there is something called the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act that was passed back in 1977, which regulates the ability of U.S. based businesses to engage in what otherwise would be deemed to be unethical practices of bribery uh, and the like. So we'll see a little bit about that. So as we look through this, we see ethics. It's a well, it's, you know, we see that's a moral principle and value applied to social behavior. Uh, business ethics is the application of moral and ethical principles in a business context. So the idea here is, when we talk about business ethics, a lot of times we'll be talking about applied ethics or professional ethics. I give uh, you as case in point uh, myself uh, as an attorney. Whatever jokes you may have heard, this one is going to sound almost like one, but not quite. Um, we have a different set of duties and obligations. We have a code of ethics, a code of practice, a code of professional conduct that has to be applied. And we basically uh, take an oath and our jobs, our licenses are literally on the line every time we have to deal with an issue that relates to uh, an ethical dilemma in the practice of law. So the classic example, uh, someone comes to me uh, on a dark stormy night and then says, hey, I need some help. And I ask them what's going on. And they tell me, well, I think I'm in trouble uh, and I'm probably going to need an attorney. And then just before we continue any more uh, effect of the conversation, sirens, uh, are heard uh, in the distance and then suddenly the guy uh, disappears but while he was standing in the doorway I noticed that he had a bag with a severed head and in one hand and a bloody machete in the other hand uh, it, I ask you the question if this were you in your role as a citizen and the police were to arrive at your home or your place of business after this event had occurred, what would you be required to do? And of course, for yourself as a citizen, unless you are also an attorney that has this case before you, you tell the police exactly what you saw. You could be summoned or subpoenaed as a witness, and you could give testimony to the fact that when the person approached you, you noticed that they had in one hand a bloody machete and in the other hand a bag with a separate head. Now, as an attorney, if that's my client, the attorney-client privilege kicks in. And if the police ask me what happened, I can tell them nothing. Because to do so essentially would, to be, would be a breach of my ethical uh, responsibility as an attorney to provide a zealous defense and to make the state their case against the person. Uh, sometimes it can be just a matter of circumstance, sometimes it can be much more serious. Um, the relationship of uh, law and ethics, uh, one thing that we see is that uh, the government has gotten involved in a lot of this, you know, things that should have been just do the right thing or do unto others. We see that this has gotten away from us in a major way when you take a look at what has happened uh, ever since um, Sarbanes-Oxley uh, back in 2002 with the, uh, with the res as a result of the Enron fiasco, 
Uh, and then we also see uh, Fraud Reduction and Data Analytics Act. Uh, we have heard a lot about uh, whether there was or wasn't a collusion, but we do know that there was a manipulation of data that was done online to try to get people to think a certain way and to act a certain way. Now we wonder more and more if that is legal. It's probably unethical because you're using the power you have and information you have in a way just to benefit one party over another without looking at the greater interest of all. Uh, some people may argue that business's responsibility is just to make a profit and that's what they did. They used the data in a way that they got the results that they proposed to get and as a result they can say that they are just really good at marketing. But uh, we do know that there are a lot of gray areas uh, and that we've slipped in those areas more frequently than we have uh, survived. And as a result, we see the law getting involved in many ways. Uh, as to the law, there's something that's referred to as the moral minimum. And that's the minimum duty of compliance. And you got to comply with the law. right? If it's illegal, don't do it. So you have a business problem and you look at what the outcomes may be. You look at some of the rules that govern that area of business and then you find out that, hey, this is illegal. So you don't do it. Now it says that many private companies and industry organizations have created their own codes of ethics uh, because some things of course are borderline like should you accept gifts when the person giving the gift or the party giving the gift is doing it primarily to get business from you and is doing this in a way to try to gather favor from you uh, and is not doing it based on the merits of their product or their service. Now I gotta turn the lights back on. Energy efficiency, another one of those ethical things. Do, do we have any obligation to the planet? talk about the triple bottom line very shortly. But the moral minimum, if it's illegal, the first question, is it legal? If it's not, then don't do it. Next question, is it ethical? Now, ethics varies from person to person, from business to business. It really shouldn't, but it does. Uh, so codes of ethics come about. So perhaps uh, you are familiar with working with the state government. If you were to offer up a contract or a proposal, uh, and you were uh, going to have a job more than uh, $25,000, uh, the state would be obligated to get three bids from three different providers or contractors in order to find the best deal. They couldn't just give one to their friend that always takes them out golfing uh, or will do certain things for them uh, if, if needed. Uh, that kind of thing. So we have procurement laws that say, well, look, anytime it's over this amount, we're going to require that you do these things. Uh, you know, when you think about it from a legal perspective, you can deal with whoever you want to. Uh, you take the risk, right? The idea in a contract, the idea in a purchase and sale, uh, the old saying of caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. So you make your own deal, you negotiate your own terms, and you try to come out with the best one possible. And for some people, what that means is that I want to do it the easiest way, the way with the least amount of work, the least amount of hassle. So I'll just give it to the first person that comes. Of course, many times they take it a step further and they'll say, well, I trust my friends. I grew up with them, so I'll give it to the first friend that I can see, uh, no matter how much the contract is. Uh, so we look at the idea of is it legal? If it's not, then is it ethical? Um, as far as the role of business in society, uh, we can see that businesses uh, want to maximize profit. Right? It says businesses can be seen as pure profit maximizers. So whatever it takes to make a buck, right, that's profit maximization. But they can also be seen, as we see more and more, functioning for a triple bottom line, the three Ps, uh, profit, people, and planet. So that this is something that we look at as far as ethics is concerned in a business context. And then um, here, the role of further um, information about the role of business in society. 
uh, you have a lot of things that you have to think about. Uh, first off, the legal implications uh, of uh, something that you do or your decision that you make, uh, because you don't want to get uh, fined or worse, thrown in jail if you find out it's a criminal act that you've committed. There's a PR impact, obviously, that uh, if it doesn't look good, it's going to really affect the business in the future. Unless you're a monopoly, then uh, that's a whole different story. But for those of us who have to compete uh, in the marketplace, we know that a bad image can be uh, terrible as far as the results upon profitability. Uh, safety risk for consumers and employees. Uh, we need to understand what may happen. Are we doing something that even though we can make a lot of money, puts our employees at risk or puts consumers at risk and perhaps this is a business that we should pass on. And then the financial implications again, like profit. Uh, is this going to be a wise use of resources? So these are some of the things that we look at. And then uh, other ethical issues in the business, uh, developing integrity and trust uh, so that's a fundamental ethical issue for business. People say that they are trustworthy, that they are deserving of their client's trust, and they earn their client's trust on a daily basis. And this is the idea that you know, ethics is really good for business, but you got to walk the walk and not just talk the talk. And businesses should ensure um, things uh, of a social nature in the workplace that they respect diversity, and when you think about all kinds of issues that are coming up now with equal opportunity and civil rights, um, we understand that this is very critical. Uh, last, you know, there's the uh, last thing you want to do is find out that you have uh, a entire cadre of people rising up against you because they've understood you to be sexist or uh, racist or something else, which maybe you have an individual right in your own lives uh, to do, but you know, as far as business is concerned, then you're impinging on the rights of others. And then business must also comply with a host of federal and state laws, as uh, I kind of alluded to in the earlier uh, talk that we had. The importance of ethical leadership. Ethics is a top-down thing. If you're Chief executive is not ethical, then why would anybody else be ethical? Uh, there are many things that can be said about that, and we can discuss them uh, depending on how you feel about things uh, that are happening today in the world, and perhaps how many alcoholic beverages you've consumed, uh, and what you just last saw on TV, so that you now have a different perspective of this idea of top-down ethics, and how is the rest of the world looking at us now? And ethical reasoning, uh, notice that there are two general areas or categories that we look at. We look at duty-based ethics, like the code that I have as an attorney. I do what the code tells me to do, uh, whether it is uh, practical or whether it seems to be immoral. The idea, though, is that it is designed with an intention of making sure that everyone gets the best defense possible even when things look like uh, they are very very clear we know that there have been so many instances in which the decisions from a legal perspective have just not come out right so that we know that people are not getting their day in court or they're not getting justice so we need to understand that we have to enforce the rules on those who are the keepers of the keys to the courthouse same thing with any other business like accounting or medicine. Uh, you have to have rules that you are uh, going to follow or need to follow because of your profession and the status that it has. So this is something that uh, we need to understand. There's also, of course, outcomes-based ethics. So the duty-based ethics is what do you as an individual have to do according to your own code of ethics. The outcome-based ethics are really related to uh, how is society affected by your decision. So what is the best possible outcome? And then we have uh, some other explanations of duty-based ethics. 
and then the uh, outcome based or utilitarian based ethics uh, notice here it says uh, the trolley problem so let me just kind of cut away uh, and, and we'll take a look at a variant of that I'm sure most of you understand uh, the trolley problem the one where the choices got to be made between uh, running over one person or running over a group of people So let me just play this. You're going to tackle the trolley. Is this a game? I don't listen. Oh, you yourself? Look, no, this is the No, this is the problem. First introduced by British philosopher Philip Phillips in 1967. You are driving a trolley when a great spirit and a representative of five workers that you will run over. Now, you can steer to another is one person who is in 75. What do you do? Do we know anything about the people? Like, is one of them an ex-boyfriend? Or that snooty girl from Rite Aid who was always silently judging my purchases? It's like, yeah, Chicky, a baby Ruth and birth control. I see the irony. Keep a swipe and... You don't know any of the workers. Okay, well, then that's easy. A switch tracks. Kill one person instead of five. This is hard. It's the only trolley I've ever been on is James Franco's ironic trolley. It travels backwards from his penguin grotto to his garage and adult tricycle. And go on, say five. Good! But there's a lot of other versions of this. Like, what if you knew one of the people? Does that change the equation? Or what if you're not the driver, you're just a bystander? Or let's throw the trolley out altogether. Let's say you're a doctor and you can save five patients. But. You have to kill one healthy person and use his organs to do it. That's not the same thing. Why not? It's still choosing to kill one person to save life, isn't it? Michael, you've been kind of quiet. What do you think about all this? Well, obviously the dilemma is clear. How do you kill all six people? So I would dangle a sharp blade out the window to slice the neck of the guy on the other track as we smoosh our five main guys. Oh, I did the thing again, didn't I? Yeah. Say more, buddy. People good. People good. Why is that so hard to remember? People What is it? Good? Good. Okay, so that idea of having uh, to deal with this dilemma of what do you do both decisions will have a negative outcome and this is what we call an ethical dilemma uh, and ethical dilemmas essentially are those situations where you have to choose between two bads uh, be easy if it was good and bad or right and wrong if, if that happens and you choose the wrong one it's called an ethical lapse uh, so we're going to see some of those issues play themselves out here locally. There's going to be a, a fairly um, a contentious and a fairly well-publicized trial going on very shortly. So we'll see how that works. Uh, and we'll see some of those ideas uh, come to fold. Uh, we might do, as they say, a cost-benefit analysis. Uh, notice there it talks about the Fort Pinto case, and you may not remember the Fort Pinto, I do, but it was something for which they figured out that it would cost $11 per vehicle to save uh, people from being horribly burned or, or killed as a result of a rear-end rear collision. And this is one of the few cases where they actually had memos of the uh, calculus that was done. They had memos in the file of a cost-benefit analysis which indicated that they could make so much more money by just selling the defective product and dealing with the lawsuits as a result of people's dying um, than, than by replacing the uh, defective piece that they actually made a calculated decision to go forward with the defect. Uh, and this is a, a very, very serious kind of uh, event and uh, there is real culpability there there is the idea that perhaps limited liability 
is not going to save people because they have willfully and intentionally put uh, money before people's well-being. Uh, the idea of, of course, then, how much is a life worth? So, uh, obviously, with that trolley problem, uh, one, kill one to save five, well, we know that there are situations where there are five, let's call them uh, secret service agents, where they will be sacrificed uh, very easily you know, to save the life of the one that happens to be the president. So, we know that there are different versions of this and people have made calculator assessments of which life is worth more. Uh, corporate social responsibility, corporations have a duty to act as responsible citizens in society. Uh, so it's not just short-run profit maximization, uh, it's also doing things to be good citizens, which means you know, looking at the long term, looking at the benefit of numerous uh, stakeholders. Uh, so it's about stakeholders, it's not just about owners or shareholders. There are different groups in the community that the business is residing in or working in that have different uh, stakes or um, interest in the community that could be affected by the actions uh, of a business. And here we see that there are these aspects of uh, business uh, short-term profit maximization. Uh, there is a real question developing about the ethical use of social media. We know that there are certain hiring practices that uh, may get involved with checking out somebody's social media background and um, may fault them and not make negative decisions towards them because of what they've seen uh, that has been shared on social media. Uh, people sometimes just don't think about these things. It's unfortunate, but it's true. When you think about it, why are you being made to take a class in ethics uh, for your MBA program? Uh, why is there an introduction of ethics at this point of your formal education in business? Our undergraduates also have to take a class in business ethics uh, or a course that covers aspects of business ethics. Uh, this is because it really isn't true that everybody knows the difference between right and wrong. Um, there are always, of course, rationalizations where people are going to be willing to come up with a uh, justification for what they did uh, as long as it suits their needs and keeps them feeling good about themselves. And, of course, there's always uncertainty about the best ethical choice. Uh, and sometimes it's just a matter of do you have a method to achieve uh, a decision? And if so, then you follow that. And if uh, it eliminates a lot of the uncertainty, you still may not come upon the best result, but at least you don't have to worry too much about why you made the decision you made. Uh, and then, of course, in making ethical decisions, uh, we, we look at, as it says, frameworks that exist to help business people make ethical decisions. There are flowcharts, there are models, there are logic maps and diagrams, and there are just uh, numerous ways that people can guide or use to guide their decisions. And then also uh, some models, of course, again, on the outcome, uh, some models focused on the responsibilities of individuals, and uh, the idea, though, is that they should both be reflective of the business, the corporation being a good citizen or corporate social responsibility. Uh, again, here is a, a format for making a decision. It's referred to as IDDR, or I desire to do right. And it starts with inquiry. Basically, know what you are working with. Understand the facts. Do not just accept things that you think may be there but are not. Do not just accept things that people are imposing upon you or suggesting to you that may not be true. And then develop a list of action options. So what choices do you have? It could be as harsh as do I run over the one person or do I continue and run over the five people? Uh, then you make a decision, which is uh, 
working together with others, looking at the uh, other stakeholders and their interest and what is going to be the most considerate and considered result that will benefit uh, the majority or create the most possible benefit uh, and then review um, assessment after the fact, consider whether the implications of the solution were effective. Because you more than likely will have to do it again. And then uh, ethics uh, on a global level. Um, this is my own experience in the last couple of weeks coming up again. Um, as far as uh, outsourcing, which is a very interesting practice that could save a lot of money. And it does, however, have its drawbacks. And I'll give you a very simple illustration of that. Uh, I'm trying to help uh, get my mom into a nursing facility. She's gotten to the point where she needs care greater than that of which any of her children can provide for her, even if her, their children were to do everything uh, all day long with you know, just to try to take care of mom, we lack the skills. So we need to find some place where people have the skills to be able to take care of her. So there are these organizations, you know, nonprofits, that try to place people with organizations of this nature. So trying to find a nursing home. And then they ask you questions on the phone, and they always start out with the Wonderful. This phone call may be recorded to uh, ensure quality performance of our jobs or whatever it says, something to that effect. And I get somebody on the phone. This happened on three different occasions with three different outreach sources. They say to me, when would it be best for someone to call you back? We'll get a specialist in touch with you. Morning, afternoon, or evening. And they give you time slots. And I say, well... I'd like you to call me in the morning, but I'm afraid that you don't know what morning is. And they all sound rather indignant. And I say, well, they say, well, what time zone are you in? And they ask me, what, what time zone are you in? And I say, I'm in Hawaiian Standard Time. And they go, oh, so Pacific. I said, no, it's a three-hour difference. So if you call, for instance, 8 o'clock Pacific, you'll be calling me at 5 a.m. Uh, and I might not be ready to take a phone call at that point in time. Now, uh, very simply, you know, this practice of outsourcing has created these kind of situations where you have people that basically do things according to a script, but they do not understand fully the implications of what it means to each individual that they're talking to. In ways as simple as, can you tell time? So... Other than that, we mentioned already the Foreign Corrupt Businesses Act. Uh, this basically says that U.S. businesses while working abroad cannot engage in bribery, even if that is not an illegal act in the country in which they happen to be dealing. Um, minor ministerial kinds of things uh, would be akin to making a payment for a permit or of sorts. So those kind of things can be allowed, but Major payments to key individuals, especially those who may be in government, uh, are, are very much illegal for U.S. businesses, even if a foreign-based business uh, would be able to do the same thing. So there are watch groups, uh, and then there are um, cautions here that U.S. businesses usually take steps to avoid such adverse publicity by refusing to deal with certain suppliers or by arranging to monitor their suppliers' workplaces. We're seeing a lot of this right now with the tariff uh, kind, uh, the tariff situation with China. Uh, the idea that many politicians, particularly our president, feel that the Chinese do not respect legal rights, in particular intellectual property rights, and thus they uh, should not be dealt with uh, as an equal because they are uh, causing situations to be unequal through their own practices. So we see those kind of situations uh, so that now instead of saying you can't deal with Chinese businesses because they are 
taking advantage or they are not ethically practicing business, um, we just say we'll make it a heck of a lot more expensive for anyone to deal with Chinese business and we'll just do it across the board and that will dissuade everyone in China from ever doing unethical things again. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's what we got here. And uh, again, I think well, I commend you to take a look at this. Uh, and uh, I may find out what I'm really trying to do next. So I'm going to uh, pause a little bit again and just work through some things that I normally wouldn't work through, but I'm hoping that you have um, watched this and taken some notes. And uh, I'm going to go over a few things, 10 of them to be exact. Uh, right after uh, I pause this thing.